Hi, everyone. This is Kara Swisher. I'm uh, broadcasting from uh, the East Coast of the United States. Uh, welcome to the Nexus Israel Dealmakers Virtual Summit. I'm here with two incredible thinkers, um, and I'd love them to introduce themselves. So, Yuval, why don't you start? Okay. I'm a historian. I teach at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. And um, I think that history is not just the study of the past. It's also the study of the present and the future. They are also part of history. So I cover all three aspects of history. All right, Daniel. Well, I'm retired. I'm an old psychologist. <laughs> I used to teach, well, I taught in many places, including Hebrew University and Princeton. And uh, now I don't teach anymore. You both have written best-selling books on different topics. I like your uh, being so modest, but you're both big thinkers um, and have written books that have been highly impactful um, in, in how people think about humanity. Um, so I want to start off by talking, and I just finished uh, uh, Daniel's new book, which is coming out in May, uh, called Noise, which I think is very provocative and interesting way to think about uh, how humans interact. Um, and about the acceleration of things that have happened since the pandemic. So I'd I actually want to start with that. I do want to talk about the top global historical trends shaping humankind today, but I just want to get to your thoughts. I know, Yuval, you've just written a really interesting piece on the pandemic and its impact. Um, I'd love you to each of you to sort of comment about where you think we are um, coming out of the pandemic as we begin to vaccinate everybody and people begin to move back into a, a, a sort of a vague version of normalcy, although I don't think anything's going to be normal again uh, post this one. But why don't you start, Yuval? Well, I think the two most important things to understand is that nothing is deterministic. There mm -hmm. are many potential outcomes to this pandemic, and it's not written anywhere in the stars. It depends on our decisions. We can decide, for instance, to react to the pandemic through global cooperation, and this will result in a more cooperative world afterwards, or we could decide to react to the pandemic by competition and isolation and greater nationalism and so forth. And this will be the world uh, after the pandemic. So that, that's one main thing. Mm -hmm. The other main thing is that different people, different countries will have very different outcomes. I think there is a lot, you know, there is a lot of discussion about the, how the economy will emerge from the pandemic, a U-shaped recovery or a V-shaped recovery or whatever, but mm -hmm. it will probably be a K-shaped recovery. Some things going up sharply and some things going down sharply. I mean, both different industries, uh, tourism collapsing, digital industries uh, wealthier than e ever, and also different countries. Some countries and regions will come out of this much more powerful than before, and some might be completely bankrupt. So I don't think that humanity has a single future mm -hmm. and a single outcome out of this or really out of any historical development. You know, I, I sometimes get the question, what should, you what should we teach our kids? It depends who we are and where you live. In some places, you need to teach your kids how to code. That's the most important thing. If you live in, in another place, you should teach your kids to shoot a Kalashnikov. That's much more, it's going to be much more important than coding computers. All right, Daniel, what do you think? How do you feel about moving out of the pandemic? I don't really believe in, in forecasting, so uh, I don't have any particular predictions about what's going to happen. My mm -hmm. sense is that uh, I do not see at the moment that there are huge changes. I mean, we are going to recover, I hope. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot depends on the virus, a lot depends on, on whether we actually do come out. Uh, but if we come out, I don't, I don't think that it's going to be a very necessarily a very profound change compared to the changes that were happening anyway uh, before mm -hmm. the pandemic. Okay, so why don't we each of you talk about the top global historical trends shaping humankind today from is there anything new or unique about our contemporary economic and political landscape or is everything just playing out as it has for centuries as you as you noted you all. I think there are two really new things happening around us. First, that this is the first time in human history that we have no idea how the world would look like mm -hmm. in a very short time, let's say 20 years. I mean, predictions were never very accurate. And, you know, if you live in the Middle Ages, you don't know what will happen in 20 years. 
maybe the Vikings will invade, maybe the Mongols will invade, maybe there'll be a plague, an earthquake, all kinds of things could happen. But at least you know that the basic features of human life are going to be the same. If you think, for example, about the job market or the skills you need, then you know I should teach my kids how to harvest wheat mm -hmm. and bake bread and ride a horse, because even if the Mongols invade, and even if the Vikings come, and even if there is a plague and an earthquake, they would still need to harvest wheat and to ride a horse. So that's a safe bet. Now we look 20 years to the future, we have no idea what the job market would look like and what skills people will need. So that's the one big thing that is, that is changing. It, it's it's the, the pace of change is accelerating. Other thing is that for the first time in history, the deep structure of, of human beings is likely to start changing. We are the same animals we were in the Middle Ages. We are still the same animals we were in biblical times or even in the Stone Age. This is why we can so easily connect to people or to works of art from thousands of years ago, were well, written by people like us. But when I look a hundred years, say, to the future or 200 years to the future, I think for the first time, it's very likely that not just our technology and economics and politics will change, humanity itself will change. Mm -hmm. The bodies, the brains, the mind structure, mental structures of people are now open to greater and greater manipulation. And I think it's a, it's a reasonable bet, I don't know for sure, but it's a reasonable bet that in a century or two, our planet will be dominated by entities which are much more different from you and me than we are different from Neanderthals or even chimpanzees. They might be, for example, inorganic entities. And after 4 billion years of organic evolution, maybe within a very short time, we will see non-organic entities taking mm -hmm. over. So, and this is completely new. It's nothing like the rise of Christianity or the industrial revolution or the second world war. So when you're talking about that, you know what, I, I recently interviewed Elon Musk and he talked about that we are still talking with our meat flaps, which are our lips apparently, but we're made of meat essentially. And it's from a very famous yeah. sci-fi story uh, of a cult, I think it's called Made of Meat. Um, so the idea that there, you're essentially talking about a robotic kind of organism of some sort. It's less about the moving parts. Mm -hmm. It's more about the command and control center. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, chain, replacing your, your organic hand for a bionic hand, it will make big changes. Mm -hmm. But the really big thing, and here it connects also to Danny's work on, on decision-making is who is making the decisions? Mm -hmm. For most of history, humans thought about life as a drama of decision-making. You look at religion, it's all about, you know, choosing between good and evil. You look at art, so every, almost every great or not so great piece of art from Shakespeare to the latest Netflix series, it usually revolves around the hero or the heroine needing to make some important decision, to be or not to be to marry X or to get married to Y. And in a very short time, these decisions might be made not by organic stuff, by flesh, they might be shifting to the responsibility, to the power of inorganic stuff, mm -hmm. of algorithms and big data algorithms and AI, and AI that know us much better than we know ourselves, and can make decisions in a wide range of areas. Okay. From so investments in banks to decisions about my romantic life, uh, better decisions in, in, according to some measures. That Less emotional. So let's get into that, Daniel, because I, your book is wonderful. I just, uh, I, finished, I read it very quickly, uh, but I, I, I have been, it's issues I've been talking about quite a lot over the years. And you talked about this idea of how decisions are made. Um, and, and the book is called Noise, uh, which essentially, it, noise feels like humanity in some ways. Maybe I'm, I'm wrong. Uh, but you did say in the book, there's, um, 
uh, that, that we live, that, that our brains are this, in our heads, we have this wonderful computer. It's made of meat. It's a computer. It's extremely noisy. So why don't you talk about your the important trends? Because this is obviously something you're talking about is how decisions are made and how they're less biased than noisy, which is, which is a really fascinating concept. So why don't you talk about that a little bit? Well, you know, this is very much in the present, uh, not mm -hmm. Uh, in the future, yeah. Uh, my my problem in this conversation is that I tend to agree with just about everything that Yuval says. Mm -hmm. So, but on the other hand, I'm not in the future as much as he is. I'm very mm -hmm. much in the present. In the present, people make decisions that are both biased and noisy. And what we mean by noise is that they're unstable and that they are different from the judgments and decisions that other people would make in exactly the same situation. And uh, that. It turns out that the mistakes that people make, the errors that people make in their judgments and decisions are due just about as much or possibly more to noise than they are to bias. And so mm -hmm. in, in recent years, there's been a great focus on bias in decision making. I think that uh, there's been too much of that focus and that the problem of noise should attract more attention. That's mm -hmm. what the book was intended to do. So when you're talking about it, the idea, define noise for people who don't understand what, what the, the concept that you're bringing out, the well, idea of what noise is. The easiest way to describe it is actually by presenting an example from which uh, the book started, really. I was consulting in an insurance company, mm -hmm. and the question I raised was whether underwriters, given the same problem within that company, would agree on the premium uh, that uh, they should set. And I asked the executives what, what they expect the difference when two uh, randomly chosen underwriters look at a problem, what difference would they expect between the premiums? And, and the difference that most people think is tolerable is 10%. That comes up in many contexts. That a 10% error is, right. is sort of tolerable. It's called and judgment, now, right? Judgment found was 55%. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is not tolerable. And what was very interesting and really was the, the major finding that prompted the book was that the organization, the insurance company, had no idea that they had that problem. It was completely new to them. And, uh, and that turns out to be quite general, that is, noise is really underestimated. So we came up with a slogan saying that wherever there is judgment, human judgment, there is noise, mm -hmm. and more of it than you think. That's mm -hmm. the motto of the book. You also called it a tax, an invisible tax on the bottom line of companies, which was, which is kind of an interesting way to put it. Um, but one of the things that you said was, you know, you talked, research has confirmed in many tasks, experts' decisions are highly variable, valuing stocks, et cetera. Um, and so one of the things you talked about, and I want to get into sort of future things with both you and Yuval, is you said it is less well known that the key advantage of algorithms is that they are noise-free. Unlike humans, the formula will always return to the same output for any given input. Superior consistency allows even simple and imperfect algorithms to achieve greater accuracy than human professionals. So does that make you say, Is, is that I couldn't tell whether that was you saying that we should rely, begin to rely on algorithms. I want to begin to talk about where we're going from a, from a mental state. You're essentially suggesting they do make better decisions. Well, there's no question that when presented with data that are representative of the problem that can mm -hmm. help solve a problem, and when you present the same data to humans and to algorithms, the algorithms do better than the humans. And mm -hmm. that, uh, and even very simple rules do, be do better than humans. And it turns out that much of that advantage, some of the advantage of very sophisticated algorithms come from the ability to find subtle patterns in big data. Mm -hmm. But the advantage of simple rules is that simple rules are noise free. And that is enough for simple rules to do better than humans in many situations. Mm -hmm. But uh, you've all, one of the things he did, though, you did say was that um, that eventually the robot will have higher emotional intelligence, they'll be wiser, 
and that uh, that computers will eventually be programmed to do even the most human of things. You all, how do you look at that when you're looking forward of where decision making is taking place? There's, you know, there's there's sort of a, a generalized panic about the idea of these inorganic organisms making decisions for us, even if they're better decisions. And they're often, they they pretty much are. Daniel was quoted saying that robot would become, would have more high, higher emotional intelligence. This is D- uh, Daniel writing. The robot would be wiser. And I'll read it directly. Wisdom is breath. Wisdom is not having a narrow view. That's the essence of wisdom. It's broad framing and a robot will be endowed with broad framing. I do not see why when it is learned enough, it will not be wiser than we people think because we don't have broad framing. We narrow thinking, we're noisy thinkers. It's very easy to improve upon us. And I don't think there's very much that we can do that computers will not eventually be programmed to do. Yeah, I I broadly agree Mm -hmm. that the impact will be everywhere, even in areas that people think, well, no, this is human, this is a human speciality. So, Mm -hmm. okay. Um, uh, computers will be able to, AI will be able to drive cars better, but things that has to do with emotional intelligence or creativity, no, this will forever be, will remain the human preserve, human speciality. And I see no reason why. I mean, emotional intelligence in essence is no, not, no different from other kinds of intelligence. It's also based on pattern recognition and, um, and I don't think that AI will have emotions of its own. One of the, of, the, of the common mistakes is to think that in order to have emotional intelligence, in order, for example, to recognize that somebody else is angry, you need to at least some days be angry yourself. Otherwise, mm-hmm. how can you recognize it? This is obviously not true. Anger is a biological phenomenon. It's all kinds of muscles contracting and neurons firing and hormones being released to the bloodstream. And uh, humans, yes, we recognize anger partly by comparing what's happening to the other person to how I feel. But it doesn't have to be like that. And I know how you're feeling by analyzing signals coming from your body. Mm -hmm. Your tone of voice, not just the content of your words, but your tone of voice, the movements of the muscles in in, in your face, your eyes, your mouth. I've learned to recognize the signals of anger. A computer can do that also without ever being angry. It's just, you know, an an algorithm. It's okay, it it has these these signals. It means the person is angry and a computer can do much more. Potentially, it can become much better than me at recognizing tiny, tiny changes in the color of your skin or in the size of your eyes that indicates anger. And it can even look under your skin with biometric, with new generations of biometric sensors, it could have direct access to your brain, to your heart, and thereby be able to recognize emotions better than human beings. And another thing is um, it won't have any emotions of its own So this gets rid of a lot, both of the bias and of the noise that uh, we we discussed earlier. Very often what clouds our judgment is Mm -hmm. our own emotions. But an AI which has no emotions is going to potentially have even a higher emotional intelligence than us because it's not clouded by, by, by these emotions. And again, this is relevant everywhere from investing in the, in the stock market, which we know, I mean, it's so much of economics is psychology. Mm-hmm. And so much of the boom and bust cycles are driven by the emotions of either individual people or huge collectives. So, you know, one way to try and overcome it is, I don't know, you put a, 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 a kind of, some kind of biometric hat Mm -hmm. on the head of the broker. And when the AI recognizes that you are now entered the irrational zone of exuberance or fear, you have a red light coming up, stop trading. You're not in a position to make good judgments. A further step is to just give the algorithm the authority to make the judgments and make the investments itself. 
mm -hmm. bypassing the humans. And in more and more professions, we are likely to see AI encroaching on, on the human domain. And again, to, to stay on the financial front, I think even today it's fair to say that the number of people who understand, really understand how the financial system works, it's less than 1% of the people on earth. And that's a very generous estimate, I think. It is. In 20 years, the number of people who understand how the financial system works might be exactly zero. It will be so complicated, so fast, so dominated by these increasingly sophisticated algorithms that no human being will be able to really understand what's happening on the financial markets. So well, you might still have a, a human as US president. Sure. But you know, yeah, the, this president will get a, a call from the AI at two o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Dear president, we are facing financial crisis. We are facing financial catastrophe. I see it coming. I can't explain to you. Why? Because you're a human, you can't understand it. But believe me, there is a financial storm coming. I analyzed all the data and you must do this. But I can't explain to you why, because you're a human. Right. I can't understand. So, 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 <laughs> you know, it's interesting because again, I'll mention Elon Musk again, he talked about the idea that eventually the AI will treat us like cats, like house cats, where we, they'll feed us and they don't really have malevolence against us necessarily, um, because that's sort of the way it's depicted in movies and science fiction. Um, and recently he upgraded it to the idea of a, um, of a hill of ants that you're driving a highway through, that you don't even think about the ants there. You might cover them, you might not, but you don't ever, they're never come into your figuring. So Daniel, when you, you've just written a book about decision-making and the things to try to, you're trying to help companies remove the noise, why even bother? Because AI is going to do it. Like why even, is there, it is even possible to remove noise from, from humanity, which is essentially judgment, right? That's what we call it. Completely removing noise from judgment is certainly impossible. Mm -hmm. uh, what is happening now is that there is uh, Algorithms are taking over more and more functions that, uh, mm -hmm. and, and, and there are, as Yuval was pointing out, there are professions that are going to disappear. I mean, mm -hmm. the dermatology diagnosis is now better done by, on your iPhone, basically, mm -hmm. than, uh, than by consulting a dermatologist. And, and this is going to be happening more and more. But at the same time, we are still in a world where it's humans making decisions. And, and there is a lot of antagonism to algorithm. In fact, there is now that phrase, algorithm aversion. Mm -hmm. uh, and so our book was written really with the near future in mind. That is, regardless of whether algorithm in one or two generations take over, for the moment, it's judgment. And mistakes can be avoided and can only be avoided by improving judgment. So. This was where we were. Do you think the humans should be removed when you're thinking, you know, you've always just talking about this future, which I think a lot of people recognize is coming, um, where a robot calls, I'm just using a broad term robot, the AI calls the president and says, this is going to happen. Is this a, a, a good thing? It, ca it causes great emotion among people, the idea. And obviously they've been, um, you know, watching a lot of sci-fi. It always ends in tears for, the hum for humanity, essentially. There is no bigger problem than that possibility of you know, what is going, if human nature is going to change or if human decisions are going to be superseded by, uh, by non-human intelligence, as you were well saying, nothing of that importance has ever happened, I think, in the history of humanity, and we're not prepared for it. Uh, the issue of whether those robots or AIs will or will not have emotions, uh, they will be programmed to have objectives and the issue of how to program AI is to have objectives that are compatible with human interests is an extremely interesting issue that some very, very good people in the AI domain, Stuart Russell comes to mind, uh, are very worried about. So what are you worried about when you think about that? Well, I'm worried about the same thing. Mm -hmm. and, uh, Yuval has articulated many of my worries. Uh, Yuval has a phrase that has haunted me ever since I read it. And the phrase was superfluous people. 
Mm -hmm. And it's the idea that uh, with the advent of, uh, with AI taking over many of the unskilled uh, and possibly some of the skilled pro uh, activities, then there will be people for whom there is, seems to be society it won't have much use for these people. And the idea of UBI, of universal uh, guaranteed income. income, basic income being, being the solution to that strikes me as a bit of a fantasy. I don't, I don't think this is coming. I don't think it's, and I don't think it's a solution. So what I see is a huge disruption. That is before we get to the world that, that Yuval uh, envisaged in his description of the future, uh, there's going to be a complete destabilization of the human condition of, mm -hmm. and of human societies. This is not going to happen quietly. And we have no idea what, how that is going to happen. What a transition to the world that you were, was talking about, which does seem possible, if not likely, but how, how you can get to that transition with humanity still surviving in any shape or form is not at all clear. We're seeing instability growing with technological change even now. Mm -hmm. And I think some of the changes that we are seeing growing populism in many countries and so on uh, is from people living life whose meaning tends to vanish. Um, Angus Deaton has, and his wife had that beautiful and, and tragic phrase, deaths of despair where they talk about increasing mortality in some parts of the United States. And it's clear that the dignity of work and the meaning of life have been changing, even are changing even now. And this has major political implications. And clearly, as we have seen, uh, this can destabilize the country. We were not very far in the United States from this. And, it, and if you take a perspective of decades, it will certainly destabilize the world. So, Yuval, that's something you've written about a lot in Sapiens and other books, the idea of these technological shifts, technology to farming, technology to this. That has happened before, these massive shifts. The shift from farming to manufacturing was a massive one, caused huge populist uprising. Everybody shifted. Talk a little bit about what happens in those transitions. And then this one you think is different, though. How is that? Because it's more, even more technologically amplified or weaponized. It happens faster. Mm -hmm. It's on a much bigger scale. Again, it, it involves, for the first time, changing not the world outside us, but the world inside us. Mm -hmm. It's not no longer just about cutting down forests and planting wheat and building cities. It's about changing the brain. It's about mm -hmm. changing the body. So it's, it goes much deeper. But I'm most worried about the fact that we have very little margin for error. When I look at previous big changes in history, let, let's take the, the, the last big one, the Industrial right. Revolution in mm -hmm. the 19th century. So there was a huge, huge change in everything, in what people do for a living, in where people live, in political okay. structures. And you can say, you know, we made some mistakes, but in the end, all things considered, the world became better. Mm -hmm. If you look at the world in the year 2000, or even 2021, and compare it to the world in 1750, at the very outset of the Industrial Revolution, on most of the parameters, human parameters that we can measure, animals, ecology, it's a different story, that's terrible. But if you just look at the humans, almost all the indicators are positive. We live longer, uh, far, huge decrease in child mortality, huge decrease in, in famine, in violence, so on, after all, we solved it. We solved the problem of how to use the power of industry for the benefit of humanity. Mm -hmm. What worries me when I look at the process is that we had a kind of learning curve. And in, we had a trial of an, an, an error. And part of the trial and error was European imperialism and was uh, the two world wars and the Holocaust and the Cold War. This was all part of the, of the learning experience of how do you manage an industrial society? We tried Nazism, no. We tried Soviet communism, no. Well, finally, we, we got a, a, a better formula. We don't have a mountain for error in the 21st century. 
if we go through another cycle, okay, we now have all these AI and bioengineering and social media and robots and whatnot, and we'll have a new round of a new Nazi regime and a new Soviet regime and another world war, we won't survive it. Mm -hmm. So this time we need to get it right in the first go. Your book about noise opened with this, you know, scattershot image. Right. We need to hit the bullseye in the first attempt because there won't be a second attempt. So at least not for most of us. What do you think of that? But Daniel's book opens with a famous, uh, the idea of a team and one team hits all the bullseyes together, other is scattered. Other is uh, other is scattered in a in a random way, and and the other anyway. There's four different bullseyes, and from the back, each group that is close together looks like they're organized. Dan, talk a little bit about that. This idea that we have to get this right. The idea of what you've always just saying. Can you react to that? I think you're very certainly right in that when the rate of change is very rapid, and then that requires adjustments that. And there I would be pessimistic, but as if the if technological change is exponential, as say Ray Kurzweil proposes, not that I believe it, it is quite as he says it, but but the rate of change is clearly higher than people's ability to cope with it. Human mm -hmm. nature is not changing at the speed that it would need. I think even to meet smaller challenges than those that Yuval talks about. Uh, there is a question of whether we can meet climate change with human nature as it is and with the governance structures that we have uh, without their changing. So there are other threats that might uh, kick us off the path even before we get to those big choices. And I agree with, uh, with you, Val, it's hard not to agree that actually this, we are in a situation of great peril because of these huge developments and because of the speed at which they are happening, which seems to be incompatible with our limited ability to react to events. You have talked about that, the inability to see the broader spectrum uh, that humans can't see, these can't frame everything at once um, and have accuracy in their judgments. So do you think the only way to deal with that is to move as quickly as possible to, to algorithmic dis decisions? Because one of the things that you, you talk, even experienced professionals, you wrote, tend to have high confidence in the accuracy of their own judgments. And they also have high regard for their colleagues' intelligence. This combination inevitably leads to the overestimation of agreement. Um, should we just cut and run very quickly uh, to, to the next stage without struggling against it? Well, I mean, you know, there will be a lot of resistance. And you have to anticipate that and just think about an AI. So we can imagine an AI that gives better legal advice mm -hmm. than lawyers, an AI sure. that can scan precedents, an AI that, that gives better diagnoses than physicians. That's not very threatening. But when you're thinking of an AI who can make better business decisions than business leaders, and you think of the business leaders having to implement that AI or resisting implementing it, uh, I think we're in for uh, completely unpredictable events uh, when when those developments occur. Because I mean, I leaders are not going to go quietly. And in general, human judgment is not going to go quietly. Between us and the cyborgs that, that Yuval has written about, uh, well, there is a, you know, there is a lot of tumult and there is a lot of bloodshed. And uh, there are many events that are completely unforeseeable now, but we know that crises are coming. So you've all, one of the things, you know, it's interesting because uh, recently Peter, Peter Thiel famously shared that he thinks that we're in an age of technological, technological stagnation, that nothing has happened in recent decades. I, others disagree, I disagree. Um, so when you think about the state of innovation uh, today, th this is sort of a dire look at this, that we don't have a chance, essentially, if we don't get the target exactly right. What are What do you see as the greatest area of potential for saving us from that fate? I think that the big innovation, which is changing the world more than anything else, is the ability, what I, I and others call the ability to hack human beings. Mm -hmm to decipher human beings, which, you know, humans have been trying to do from the beginning of history. Humans are extremely complicated. 
And throughout history, we just didn't have the tools to really understand how humans function, how they make decisions and, and, and so forth. To hack a human being, you need massive amounts of data, especially biological data, because we are mm -hmm. biological entities. Mm -hmm. And you need massive amounts of computing power to make sense of it. Previously in history, we just didn't have this. Our understanding of, of biology was extremely limited. The ability to gather data on masses of people was also very limited. And we didn't have the, the computing power either. If you think about even the KGB in the Soviet Union, you can't put a KGB officer to follow each and one of the uh, almost 200 million Soviet citizens. You don't have 200 million Soviet agents, KGB agents. And even if you have, what do you do with the data that they gather? I mean, it's, I don't know, 1960 in Moscow, they follow you around, they write a paper report, they send it to headquarters in the center of Moscow, and then you have piles and piles and piles of, of paper reports. Now, somebody needs to read them and make sense of them and reach conclusions, which will become more paper reports. So it's, it's uh, even in a totalitarian regime, it's really impossible. Doesn't work, doesn't scale. No, no, it's feasible. You don't need human agents to follow everybody around. You have these gadgets. I mean, I, I have my own, I bought the agent that follows me around. Mm -hmm. The government didn't have, even have to force me to, to, to have it. You have all these smartphones and microphones and cameras everywhere. And you don't need humans to go over all the resulting data and analyze it. You now have AI and machine learning. So it's becoming feasible for the first time in history to hack all the people. And you add to that the increasing biological knowledge and th that's the explosion. That we are very close to the point when nobody will ever know people 100%. That's impossible. It, it's impossible in nature to know something 100%, but you don't need to. You just need to know people better than they know themselves. And that is the, the big game changer of the 21st century. Now, this new ability has enormous positive potential as well as enormous negative potential. It can create the best healthcare system in history, which recognizes illnesses long before you feel there is anything wrong with you. And it can create the worst totalitarian regimes that ever existed. Something far, far worse than the Soviet Union. Something that can really get into your mind 24 hours a day. And that's the big choice that we are facing. Now, there is cause for some optimism because we can still choose to use the technology for good and not for evil. It's difficult, not only because there are many bad actors out there, but also because it requires us to be much more humble about who we are. Humans resist the idea that they are hackable that somebody can really know me better and manipulate me. But to uh, survive what's happening right now, we need to come to terms with who we really are, with the fact that I personally don't understand myself very well, but increasingly some other agents might be able to do it. To be in, in this sense, much more curious about ourselves, and much less certain about our opinions, about our thoughts. And this, again, it, it goes back to the work that Danny has done, not just in this book, but for previous books also for decades. I mean, finding the, 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 the biases, finding the usual, the shortcuts, the heuristics of the human mind. It presents, when we look in the mirror, and it forces us to see ourselves in a much more humble way. And if we are able to accept this and embrace it, this can be a basis for a much better world. Mm -hmm. But if we stick with the kind of egocentric and arrogant view of ourselves, then may, it, makes it, it makes us extremely vulnerable to this new kind of technology. So Daniel, you did. You have written a lot about these ideas of biases and people knowing themselves. And you've also talking about is why even bother? 
Why even bother since the computers will do will figure this out anyway? We all have sort of begun to accept that these these devices that follow us around really do know us better. I think most people are terrified of it. Um, it's been misused. It's been easy. All the all the negative parts have been have been accessed with these technologies, or it feels like it has been. I'd love you to talk about what that means, and then wh are there positive aspects given the the ability to manipulate it so perfectly? I was troubled uh, by Yuval's optimism mm -hmm. uh, in, in his last remarks. And what troubled me were the use of the word we. Mm -hmm. That is, we can do. Yeah. I'm not sure there is a we. Agree. And that is yeah. really the problem that we face, is that there is no we. It's going to be various people, a group of people, groups of people acting in their own self-interest. And it's mm -hmm. not going to be or as they perceive it. And, and the, there would be a we for humanity if we were attacked from outer space by another uh, yeah, you know, species out mm -hmm. there. But there is no we when we're de dealing even with climate change, let alone with AI or with other things. Now you ask uh, me a question that is almost a personal question. Why am I still interested in yeah, I know. people when AI is coming? Well, yeah. you know, the reason is I've been interested in people since I was a child. Yeah. And, and AI isn't in my life yet. Mm -hmm. uh, it's going to be very different, uh, certainly. Uh, the, the intellectual interest and the views about human nature are going to be affected by the sort of developments that, uh, that Yuval was describing. And and I think more than anything else, possibly even more than AI, mm -hmm. the possibilities of, of hacking human beings, of hacking the biology of, of children, of changing the genetic makeup of people, uh, especially which will be available to some people and not available to others, the possibility for human enhancement, even before we're replaced by cyborgs. Uh, th this is something that we're not absolutely not equipped to deal with at the moment. And mm -hmm. it's very difficult to see how we, as, as nations, as states, can go to cope with it. How does that spin out then, if you're not able to cope with it, if it's coming anyway, if the ability to hack into brains, not just that, but person, you know, as you said, just replacing your hand is one thing, but replacing strength, there's all kinds of things that you can do to enhance yourself. How do we deal with that? What is the mechanism then? The question is whether democracy can be sustained. Mm -hmm. I think you know, that's, that's going to be a question that will arise before we face the the bigger future threats. Uh, what is happening is that the powerful are becoming more powerful. Mm -hmm. Money is becoming more powerful. I mean, the power of money over democracy in the United States has, has I think, increased radically in my lifetime that I can remember. And, and clearly, when the rich can enhance their children and the poor cannot, uh, this is going to get much worse. So. Inequality is already a problem, and that's the inequality that is given. And it's very difficult to cope with. Although everybody deplores inequality, there are powerful forces, for example, in the United States, that, that keep it increasing. How are we going to be able to deal with that as societies in the future? There are no signs at the moment that the ability of governments to deal with this is improving uh, to meet the challenges. To my surprise, a little more pessimistic than you. Mm -hmm. So, Daniel, when you're talking about that, we, we do have this similar situation of people, the, the com com uh, companies in this in this country, in the United States, but they're global companies. Um, the top 10, five companies are all technology companies. The top, to, uh, except you leave out Saudi Aramco, I think of that group. Um, and the top 10 richest people, I think all of them, almost all of them are technology uh, billionaires. They also have, their wealth has risen rather significantly during the pandemic. They've benefited from all the services we've used. It, this is, you wrote about this, Yuval, very smart as how we've moved into a virtual world rather easily during this pandemic. It's been a been a, a boon for us to be able to do so, to be able to do school or even as, as problematic as it's been 
Um, so when you look at this, you know, this idea of a small group of people making decisions, how do you how do you think about that? When there's a, one of the encounters I had with uh, one of the Google founders, uh, when I wrote, um, they were trying to take over all of search, and I said they can't be allowed to do this. And I used the example of Microsoft sort of dominating technology for a long time. And I said, at least Microsoft knew they were thugs. Um, He was offended by this characterization of of him as a thug. And he called me up and he said, I'm not a thug. And I said, yeah, well, you're not a thug, but who's going to run Google in 20 years? I don't know. Maybe they're a thug. Maybe it's not even a thug. Maybe it's a machine. I don't, maybe it's a thuggish machine. And the concept of it sort of, he was like, that's ridiculous. We're good people. Talk about the idea of decision makers, <laughs> right? Sure, they aren't good people, as it turns out. Um, they're not bad people either. So talk about this idea of making, dis- how when you concentrate in the hands of a small amount of people, what disintegrates when that happens? Well, let me first actually, before I answer your question, mm-hmm. uh, let me say something about Yuva's previous remarks, because mm-hmm. I think he put his finger on something that is very important. We tend to think very naturally that that the events in the world are the events that we know about. Uh, mm-hmm. They are the events in, you know, in the Western world. But actually, the future will be determined by China. It's mm-hmm. what's happening internally in China, and it's the leadership of China, and it's the behavior of China in the in with respect to other people and to other nations that is going to determine, you know, the history of the 21st century. So. I think any thinking really should go in the direction that uh, Yuval's comments were going. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, What is going to happen in China is really very important. What is happening in the United States with a growing inequality in wealth and power, the inequality as such is means that the democracy becomes sort of a a fiction. That is, if as, as we can see even in the United States as it exists now, the power of money to, to buy politicians, not buy them in terms of corruption, by, by supporting them, by supporting their campaign, the power of money over politics in the United States is poisonous. And clearly, when there is a threat of universal basic income, uh, there are quite a few billionaires, and I'm thinking of you know, Rebecca Mercer, for example, will mm-hmm. not let that happen. Mm-hmm. So, and she and people like her have a lot of power. Now, we are lucky to have quite a few billionaires who are really very benign. Mm-hmm. Uh, Buffett is benign, Gates is benign, and the, the, the Google founders want to be benign. But the concentration of power in the hands of a few people is really what democracy was created in the hope of avoiding. I mean, mm-hmm. the, you, humanity has tried to avoid this. And, and I think the concentration of power clearly has been getting worse over the last few decades. Mm-hmm. In the United States, I mean, this is very much a, a United States centric uh, point that I'm making. So when you, when you have decision making in those hands, I mean, you're famously famous about understanding decision making what happens uh, at those levels i only know my experience is they get you know i hate to use this term but they get licked up and down all day and they think they're right all the time and when someone challenges their thinking i often do they seem shocked um but that that, that they're totally incapable of making the decisions and you saw that play out in the election with two people deciding to kick one president off uh, off of an important platform Uh, or important social media platforms. Now, while that might have been the right decision, it might have followed the rules correctly, the fact that there were two people making it seemed troubling to me, at least, even if I agreed with the decision. Yeah, I think it should be troubling to everybody. I mean, there is huge power. There has been a huge transition of power to the technological companies, and some of which are controlled really dictatorially. I mean, there's no, no question. Those are single individuals making the, making yeah. decisions with their own self, with their own interests. I, I would not trust any individual to know the true motivations for the actions that they're taking. Insight is, uh, is a difficult thing to acquire. So yeah, clearly very dangerous. So and what- we see it happening. 
what do you do about that? Either of you, what is the, what, what, how do you change that? Are there opportunities for positive change here in that? And it, do you feel like governments have the ability to do something about this amount of, in this case, it happens, it used to be oil barons, it used to be train barons, whatever, over history, it used to be whatever. Um, how do you, how do you change that today? Because it's been changed. There's been lots of powerful people that have been unseated rather unceremoniously over all, throughout human history. Yes, I think politics is all about that. That, and as I said at the, the very beginning of our talk, we always have choices. It's never deterministic what's going to happen next. Technology, the same technology can be used to construct very different kinds of social and political systems. The technology of the 20th century could be used to create a regime like Nazi Germany or like the democratic United States. It was the same technology. There wasn't a big difference in technology mm -hmm. between uh, the US under Roosevelt and Germany mm -hmm. under Hitler. Or right. if you look today at North Korea and South Korea, the difference is not technological. So I'm, as a historian, I'm very skeptical and also very worried about technological determinism. Mm -hmm. That because we have this technology, the only outcome must be that. It, it, it's never like this. It's usually a fiction told by people who want this outcome. So they tell you, well, it, it's inevitable because right. this is what the technology dictates. It's not true. In the 19th century, the big magnates of the coal and steel industry told people, well, we have to, we must have child labor. It's, this is the new economy. We must have eight-year-old kids working in coal mines instead of going to school. If we don't do it, if you make laws against it, the Germans will do it and they will overcome us. Today we look back and first of all, we know it wasn't so. Parliament in the UK and then in Germany and other places passed laws that kids should go to school and not to the coal mine. And we also understand that actually this was even more efficient the country benefits when the economy benefits, when eight-year-old kids go to school and not to a coal mine. So to now it, it looks to us obvious, mm -hmm. but if you go back to 1860 or 1870, it's a huge debate. I mean, and some people say, no, it has to be like this. It's not, um, right. we don't like it, but this is right. the technology. This is the industrial revolution. Yeah, there's actually an argument like that right now with tech people talking about China versus the US, like they need to be this big, I call it the she or me argument that Mark Zuckerberg often makes. It's that it's either China or me. And I was like, neither. What, what's the yeah. third choice? Where's my third? I think there are third choices. We yeah. can build. That's a choice, we should, at least. We should build, I mean, there are, there are certain kind of guidelines mm -hmm. for how to build, let's say, the data economy in a better way. To give just a few examples, mm -hmm. whenever you increase surveillance of individuals, at the same time, you need to increase surveillance of the government and the big corporations. This should be a, a, a key principle that, okay, we have this technology. It has a lot of potential. It, like you need to find the, the pandemic, the COVID crisis. So surveying people is a very important tool in fighting the pandemic and I'm in favor but on condition that simultaneously you also increase the surveillance of the government. The government is now spending trillions. I want to know easily where the money goes and who makes the decision to make sure the money goes to the people who really need it and not to some big corporation who happens to be friends with, with the minister. Mm -hmm. And it's the same technology. If it's now easier to survey me, it's also easier to survey you. And it doesn't make us less efficient than China if we do that. Because, you know, again, you look at, at, the, at the pandemic, there is a huge discussion whether the pandemic would even have erupted in the first place if China was democratic. Nobody really knows for sure what happens in the first few weeks. Now, I, I, not for a moment do I believe any of the ridiculous conspiracy theories about it was produced in a lab or something. No, 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 I'm not going in that direction. It's just that, you know, when you, first, the first, when you have the first few cases, the inclination of an authoritarian regime that has full control of the media is to repress bad news, not to tell yep. bad news. Not because of some big conspiracy from the top, because, you know, the people at the bottom, they don't want to share the bad news. And you don't have a free press to write about it, so you can hide it. 
and then you have more cases and more cases until it explodes and then it's too late to stop it. In a democracy, maybe the local officials would also have tried to, to clamp down and to prevent yeah. the information from spreading, but you have journalists and you have bloggers and somebody would have blown the whistle earlier and maybe this whole thing would never have happened. Similarly, if you think about the vaccines, so I would trust a vaccine coming from a democratic country. I would not trust a vaccine coming from an authoritarian regime and, and, and until it is checked mm -hmm. by health authorities in a democratic country. And yes. for an obvious reason, I mean, it's, it's such an important tool today, the vaccines. I don't trust that in an authoritarian regime, the university or the laboratory or the health authority, if they find that the vaccine is dangerous, I don't trust them to tell the truth about it. Okay, so one of the things you've always talking about, um, Daniel, is noise, is the noise that democracies make, which are very noisy. I want you to make the case for noise, then. If this is what's going to prevent it, the idea of people making noise about being unpredictable, making bad decisions. Is it so bad to make bad decisions all the time? Well, uh, I think bad decisions are bad. Mm -hmm. uh, and variability can be bad or variability can be very desirable. So right. the essence what makes life worth living, what makes life interesting is variability. Uh, when different physicians looking at the same patient give different diagnosis, yeah. it's noise. So uh, Which is bad noise. Bad noise. Is bad noise. Right. Uh, Diversity is desirable in many contexts. Uh, what we are seeing though is, and that's the danger to democracy, the centralization of power, for example, in institutions such as Facebook on the one hand and Fox News on the other, mm -hmm. uh, the, the possibilities for misuse of, of this kind of power is really antithetical to the very idea of democracy. And it's, it, you know, my imagination, I tend to be pessimistic by temperament. So mm -hmm. uh, good scenarios come, do not come easily to my mind, but how to have a good scenario where you would have democratization mm -hmm. and at the same time, uh, undo what has been happening, which is the different communities are exposed to different facts. Mm -hmm. uh, how to undo that? is certainly beyond my imagination, but unless we undo it, the future of democracy is really very much in doubt. Well, I'm gonna press you then, because I feel like you might be a smart person winning all those awards that you have. How would you begin to undo? Just one thing you talked about, the poor information diet is what you're talking about, is that people get, uh, you know, this is sort of classic propaganda, what's going on uh, every day is a different thing, whether it's anti-vax or it's uh, election fraud or whatever. Um, how, do you, how do you begin to turn back that tide? I live in the United States, well, well two of us do. There are countries that are doing it better. I mean, I think that clearly what is happening in Western Europe with respect to uh, technology, the efforts to control technology, the efforts to protect privacy, uh, there is a lot that can be learned from what they're doing. Uh, it is not uh, stopping what looks to be, I mean, it's, it's not clear that populism is really spreading. It's, it's, there are ebbs and flows, but it certainly is not stopping some populist developments uh, that could lead to fascism and so on. But there is an example there, I think, that today the United States democracy is more threatened in the United States than it is in Western Europe. Mm -hmm. And there is an interesting thing living, you know, as a foreigner in, in the United States, that there is a reluctance when you're an American, there is a reluctance to look elsewhere for inspiration. Yeah. To look elsewhere for uh, how, how could it be that anybody could do things better there than they're done here? Well, you know, we're exceptional. I don't know if you've yeah. gotten that message when you got here. We're supposed to give you that book. Just, yeah. yeah. Uh, and that, that is preventing, I think it, it really is remarkable. Yeah. How little people know in the United States about how things work elsewhere, yeah. like health systems. I mean, many people in the United States think that they have the best health system in the world. Yeah. Now, 
what what is the sort of it's not a conspiracy but what is happening in the culture that allows such facts to remain unknown for decades within a democracy and and clearly when that gets to be manipulated like mm -hmm. for example news about climate change get politicized and and manipulated the threat is very uh, the threat level is very high. But when you think about that, Yuval, the, the idea of bad information diets, ba humans getting bad information and not being able to avail themselves to other other things. Can you think historically if there's been a turning point like that? Because, you know, we've had the Salem witch trials. We've had, you know, there's all kinds of conspiracy theories around forever since the beginning of time. You know, Mussolini didn't need Instagram to make this, make it happen. Hitler did not need Twitter. Um, I, I know it sounds silly to phrase it like that, but they used newsreels. They used whatever was the yeah. technology of the time. Can you talk about something that where it, 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 it was a similar thing where the tide was able to be turned and why? I think the situation is bad, but it's probably better than almost any time in the last thousands of years. Mm -hmm. But as you say, we, you just look a hundred years back to Nazism and fascism and communism, and they could spread disinformation and conspiracy theories and brainwash people mm -hmm. on a massive scale with even worse theories and stories than, than you see today extremely successfully without Twitter and Facebook and social media. You go a thousand years or hundreds of years previously, and like you mentioned, the, 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 the whole witch hunting craze, mm -hmm. that it's the result to a large extent in Europe and in uh, the, the British colonies, like in Massachusetts, is the result of print. People think that when Gutenberg brought print to Europe, the result was the, 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 the scientific revolution and everybody would sit around reading Galileo Galilei and, and, and Copernicus. Very few people read Galileo Galilei and Copernicus. Mm -hmm. Most people either read the Bible or they read all these new ridiculous conspiracy theories like uh, about witches. One of the biggest bestsellers uh, of, of the first days of print in Europe was called The Hammer of the Witches. It was a do-it-yourself guide how to identify and kill witches, which mm -hmm. is something everybody needs at home, of course. Mm -hmm. And people would buy it for, for, a for a fraction of what it would cost earlier before print. And they believed it completely because you know books were in such high regards. So people would say, I read it in a book. There right. are witches and they fly on brooms at night and you can recognize them because they have this wart on the face or whatever. And thousands upon thousands of innocent people, mostly women, were murdered gruesomely because you had these frenzied mobs believing in these ridiculous conspiracy theories. So you don't need Facebook for that. And in a way, the situation in the early 21st century, again, it's, it's bad, but it's better than in the early 20th century. It's better than in the 16th century. The key problem is that the truth is very often first complicated, much more complicated than some fanciful story somebody invents. And secondly, that it's very painful. Most people don't want to know the truth about themselves no. as individuals or as collectives. Like we have an election in Israel coming up in a week, next week. Mm -hmm. Another, wow. Okay. Another, yeah, well, we were very fond of elections. <laughs> Sorry, I've lost track. <laughs> and a politician that would tell the Israeli public the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth about Israeli history has a 100% guarantee of losing the elections. There is no way that such a politician would ever win an election. And that's not unique of Israel. A politician that would do that in the US is bound to lose the elections. And it's the same in Italy and in Poland and in the Philippines and everywhere. Mm. People don't want to know the full truth about their nation or about their culture or about themselves personally. It's an uphill battle. We are in a better place than we were previously in history. But um, again, here I'm not very optimistic because the basis for human success is not the truth, it's cooperation. And it's easier to cause people to cooperate with a fiction mm -hmm. than it is with the, with the truth. Again, happened? because the fiction can be made much easier and much more likable than the truth. 
So mostly in history, you don't see a correlation between the truth of a theory and its political appeal. In science, yes. If you want to build an atom bomb, you need a correct physical theory of the universe. Mm -hmm. But in politics, no way. Fiction so, usually trumps the truth in politics. So Dale, let's talk about this because one of the things that I, I, I study QAnon and the others quite a bit, and one of the things that's really interesting in terms of decision, because it's a lot of his decision making when they're when they're reading this stuff. You know, they thought the election was cooked, obviously, and were convinced of it, and that was repeated. Oh, very typical propaganda. I think constant repetition appeal to fear, appeal to financial problems, things like that. But one of the things that I find interesting is when they're making these decisions, the people that read this, if you could sort of plummet, the one that they, the most recent one was that Biden is actually Trump and they changed faces. Um, I know it sounds crazy, but that's one of the ones. And and I, I was like, that's a movie that was with Nicholas. Uh, Cage, just FYI, it was called Face Off. It's always a movie. It's always some movie that they've decided to pop into reality or their version of reality. So what happens is when they when something doesn't happen, like the it turns out he isn't them. Now Biden is an AI figure. Uh, oddly enough, he's a robot who is programmed by AI. Also, Tom Hanks and some other people are also robots. And the reason they wear masks is because they haven't figured out the mouth around it. The AI hasn't perfected the mouth. And so I know it sounds crazy to say this, but they, and then they continue when something gets in their way. Can you talk about how people do that from a decision-making perspective to shift from one thing to the next, to the next well, crazy theory, essentially? I mean, there is, you know, there is a basic principle of the way the mind works. The mind seeks coherent stories and we tell, and we construct coherent stories. Sometimes they're closer to the truth, sometimes they're not. What determines our confidence in the theories is not whether they're true or not. It's whether they're coherent or not. And, and by coherence, I mean both internal coherence, that you can tell a story and it seems to make sense. Mm -hmm. You've now explained to me, you know, why so many people wear masks. Uh, and, and that's, <laughs> ah, that's it. something I hadn't thought before, but now you've told me mm -hmm. it sounds right and it's very convincing and I believe in it and it's new and I want to tell it to my friends. Uh, but the, the coherence also is emotional coherence. That is, you have to have the right heroes, the people that you already like, and you have to, to have the right villains, the people you already hate. And when you can construct a story that has the right heroes, the right villains, and some coherence. It really doesn't have to be true in any scientific way. People will have confidence in it because our confidence, and this is something that for scientists, I mean, mm -hmm. is very difficult to accept. Because you talked about confidence in your last book. Confidence that people have in their beliefs has very little to do with truth. The confidence mm -hmm. has everything to do with internal coherence and with emotional coherence. And that makes it relatively easy to make people believe in all sorts of fictions. We just need to remember that the fears that these kinds of stories express, they should be taken seriously. Mm -hmm. Because if, if you now have a theory that Biden is actually an AI, so the, the, the actual story is ridiculous, but it does channel a legitimate and very powerful and very realistic fear. We just spent an entire hour talking about AI taking over the world. Mm -hmm. So when somebody believes that Biden is actually an AI, so literally it's of course, it's, it's nonsense, mm -hmm. but it does make sense in the sense, yeah, AI is taking over the world. The president of the US is one of the most powerful people in the world. So the president of the US is an AI in, in, a, in a kind of um, analogical sense or a metaphorical sense, the metaphor is correct. Mm -hmm. Or any you say Biden is actually Trump, this again, it channels a deep fear that all these politicians are interchangeable. Mm -hmm. Republicans, Democrats, in the end, they all screw us and we are left with nothing. So we, Biden is Trump is, is factually, of course, ridiculous, but it does encapsulate some kind of mm -hmm. true metaphor. To combat conspiracy theories, we also need to understand what makes them attractive right. and to um, see the legitimate fears or concerns that make them attractive to people. 
It's, it's absolutely true. Daniel, when you think the second part, and then I want to, we have about 20 minutes, I want to finish up on two major issues, which is whether we should have humans around at all. Um, and, and then what you see is hopeful. But when you think about what's happening with the, with the onslaught of technology, um, one of the things that I spent a lot of time thinking about is the reductive nature of it, of how it goes down to short, uh, reductive things versus, you know, uh, PR versus policy, phrases versus thought. Even if uh, decision making and judgment is noisy, what's happening now is something very different. Do you think that the human brain is being shifted into a reductive nature where everything is, you know, you see like they pop up every day, like Dr. Seuss, which isn't really, when you start to explain it, it's not really a thing, but it becomes a thing. Do you think things are happening in our brains around decision making because of the reductive nature of these technologies? Well, I don't think that the brain is being changed by what is happening. I mean, mm -hmm. evolutionary changes take longer. The yes, they brain do. The is, is really the same as it's been. Uh, what, what is happening, and I'm not sure how different it is from what was happening earlier, is the speed of change and the speed of news, uh, that seems to be accelerating. Mm -hmm. And the, the shifts of interests, and probably, uh, the number of time that people consult their their phone during a day, mm -hmm. uh, this is changing the way the mind works. It's not changing the brain, but it certainly makes it makes our minds vulnerable to shift and to influence by from the outside more than before. No question about that. How do you change that? The, it, how does it affect decision making? Because you talk about decision making a, a lot in terms of how people make decisions. Who's decision making? It, it has, it clearly, all that we're saying, all that we're seeing is it creates communities. I mean, mm -hmm. I don't think that people, you know, make all that many decisions on their own. I mean, People are very influenced by their neighbors' decisions. And if you want to know, you know, what people think, ask what their neighbors think before we, you ask about their personalities or their ideas or whatever. Uh, we're, in, we're in our communities and communities are now being created by social media. New kinds of communities are being created. And so I don't think that it's changing. I don't think that people are less autonomous or more autonomous than they were before. Uh, they were influenced, they, they were different sources of influence. People were under the influence of a church and now it's not a church, now it could be Facebook. But the idea that you're drawing your thoughts from mm -hmm. the outside, that is not new. Uh, human nature hasn't changed in that respect. So you've all that's you talk about the sweep of history. Are you optimistic or pessimistic about the future of humanity? I know it's a big question, but I'm going to ask yeah, it but... anyway. I mean, obviously, it feels up. It feels pessimistic. He's just saying it was the church before. So what if it's Facebook? Maybe that's even better because it's more transparent of what's happening, or people have more access to information. I think there is ground for some optimism okay. because we do see we do see very positive changes in history. And I'm not talking about the material changes. That's easy. Okay, we invented vaccines. Okay. I'm talking about positive changes in ethics, in morality, in, in social interactions. Um, the level of violence today in the world is lower than in any previous time in history since the agricultural revolution. And, and by, a, by a very big margin. And even as a resident of the, of the Middle East, I, I, I know that there are still wars in the world I, I live in Israel, I know that, but still you look at almost all the numbers, violence is at a historical low. And it's not because of some new technology. It's people really changed the way they build societies, the way, the, the way they make decisions. Yes, technology has something to do with it. The threat of nuclear war is a part of, 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 of this reduction, but still people needed to make better decisions and they made better decisions. Since Hiroshima, there wasn't another world war. And to take another example, if I look at the feminist revolution, it's one of the biggest revolution ever in human society. You know, for thousands of years, you had political revolutions and economic and technological. One thing remained constant, that men dominate women. Mm -hmm. And then within a very short time, historically, about a century, it's not that we've reached a point of complete equality, far from it, 
but things change dramatically. And what makes me even more optimistic about this example, it was done peacefully. You know, many people say that in order to make omelets, you need to break some eggs. Mm -hmm. They didn't break any eggs in the feminist revolution. Maybe the enemies of the feminist revolution, they used violence, but the feminists didn't. They didn't start any war. They weren't terrorists. They didn't build up guillotines in city square. They didn't send people to the gulag and they completely changed the world. So it's, it's an example, it's not a guarantee, mm -hmm. but it's, it's an example that you can change the world for better, quickly, peacefully, and without inventing a new technology, just by changing people's minds. All right, what is your case for humanity, uh, Daniel? Not very different from you, Val. I mean, we draw on the same information. Mm -hmm. that things have been improving. There is a secular trend. Um, clearly, that depends a great deal on education. Mm -hmm. And so there, there is hope if you can improve education. The, the question really is, is whether the speed at which things can improve and can match the speed at which dangers are, are arising. Mm -hmm. and, and whether you're an optimist or a pessimist, which depends largely on your genes anyway, but if you're an optimist, you're going to see things one way. If you're a pessimist, uh, you are going to mm -hmm. see a lot of perils and a lot of changes for the worse and, and the changes for the better are, are fragile. And all the improvements that we see, and there's no question that we're seeing big improvements, they're also quite fragile, as, uh, as I think all of us could easily agree. What is each of you, what is the biggest challenge you think we're facing as a planet, I guess, as a global planet? I think we've talked about it the, the, whole, yeah. the, whole, the whole hour. It's uh, this accelerating pace of technological change, mm -hmm. especially this ability to hack human beings. You know, nuclear war is extremely frightening, but at least every, nobody wants nuclear war. Mm -hmm. And the only question is how to prevent it. The, the goal is clear. And it's the same with climate change. Nobody wants climate change and ecological collapse. Some people say it's, it's a myth, it doesn't happen, but even they, they don't like it. They just mm -hmm. say it's not real. Right. Now with the technological disruption, it's very different. A lot of people are working very hard to accelerate these things. Yeah. What for some of us are nightmares, for them, they could be dreams. Mm -hmm. And there is no consensus about what is the desired end. AI is coming, what to do with it? There is no consensus around it. It's going to change the very meaning of what it means to be human. So at least intellectually, it's a much more complicated challenge. We are not, it's not clear what is the danger and what is or if the- it's not beneficial versus anything else. When you look at, uh, you know, a lot of these, they're, in fact, they're all tech billionaires talking about going to space. When you see them doing that, how do you look at that? I don't have any objection to going to space. Yeah. I, I think it's a kind of escapism. You know, yeah. in, when one of the main interpretations for the space race in the mm -hmm. 50s and 60s is that there was a growing sense that the planet is doomed. Right. So even subconsciously, leaders in the Kremlin, in the White House, okay, we need to look for somewhere else because this place is going yeah. to hell. Mm -hmm. And then the Cold War ended and also the space, the space age seemed to be forgotten. Okay, planet Earth is, is saved. We can just stay here and build a good life here. And now when again, it seems that everything is going, is going down, you have these billionaires, okay, this place is lost, we've ruined it, we need to look for, for, for a new place to, to, to settle. So I, I think at least some of that is, is coming from that psychological uh, tendency. And that's mm -hmm. very, very dangerous because we won't do it in time. I don't see any way that we can build colonies on Mars or wherever in time. Even if we do, it will be enough for, I don't know, a few thousand people. Mm -hmm. the, billions and billions of people on planet Earth need focus that all these giants of industry should focus on how to save this planet mm -hmm. before reaching other planets. So uh, Daniel, what is your, from your, the biggest challenge you see going forward? As you had said, we've been talking about these challenges mm -hmm. uh, uh, 
you know, in principle, the big challenge is to tame human nature. Uh, and I don't see any quick way of doing it. As for the race to space, it's a game. I mean, clearly it cannot be serious. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and, and people do this because they can and because they can create more visible change and they could if they spent their billions in trying to improve the lot of humanity, which is slow and difficult. And in that sense, I would say Bill Gates looks like an adult in the room. Mm -hmm. That he is not playing those games and he is actually trying to deal with the problems as, as they exist. But there mm -hmm. is a lot of play. Yeah, yeah. I was I just did an interview with him and I said, You used to be Darth Vader and suddenly you're Luke Skywalker or someone. I don't know what happened. But but speaking of that, President Company excluded, of course, who are the most important figures shaping human history right now? I suppose they are unknown engineers somewhere working on something which they have no idea what would be the, the, the repercussions of that something that they're probably changing the world more than anybody else. And th that's reason for concern because uh, going back to the idea of noise, that's kind of historical noise. It's suddenly out of nowhere, some new technology comes and changes everything. And all our expectations and all our predictions are, are, are not worth much. So I would say th these kinds of people are the most important uh, changers at the moment. With lack of appreciation for consequences. Usually they have tunnel vision that they are developing an app or a technology and they are very focused on solving a particular technical problem. They don't think very much about what would be the consequences for politics, for culture, for human psychology, and, and, and so forth. This is usually the case. I mean, one of, the, one of the things that enable them to be such good engineers is that they have little distracting noise from elsewhere, thinking about, oh, what the consequences will be for the, the, the global geopolitical situation. They couldn't possibly see the consequences. I mean, we've been talking for an hour and a half or so, as if we could know the future. Mm -hmm. But the fact is, you know, there is a lot of history to tell us we can't tell the future. Technological forecasting, the, the forecasting of scientific development has just a miserable record. Mm -hmm. Now we can't help but be confident in our ability to predict because we see those trends and we can't imagine other stories. And our sense of what is inevitable comes from limited imagination and from every possibility of devising or inventing new stories. In fact, as, as Yuval is saying, if you're asking who are the most important people in the world today, the answer is we have no idea, they have no idea. It's going to be known in the future. <laughs> and in the future, people will be pointing and said, oh, that was the important development because it had consequences. And it's nobody's fault that they couldn't foresee the consequences because our ability to foresee is very limited. Except if it's AI and then they figured the whole thing out. But, but, but Daniel, I'm going to push you though. Okay, 20 years ago, who was the most important person that, that is now today that we can now see since we have hindsight? If you want to talk about politics, I would find it difficult. Clearly somebody in China, I would say, is the most important person, whether it's she or somebody else who is controlling the future of politics. Uh, that's a trivial answer. Mm -hmm. If you're looking at, uh, at science, I think that the people who are the most, you know, who are the most important today are playing an important role. Uh, 20 years ago, there were children, there were scientists. They're young people, by the way, are changing the world. It's people in their 40s or in their 50s. It's Demis Asabis in the context of AI, it is uh, Jennifer Dudna and, and, and people who are younger than she is. She is an elder uh, mm -hmm. compared to some others. Uh, those are the important people and they get identified only retrospectively. Retrospectively. All right, so it, let, me, let me then put you in a situation, so we only have a few more minutes, is if you had to start today, you wanna to leave some hope for young people because one of the things that I find very, 
helpful is when I do talk to young people. I feel a lot better about the planet for some reason. Um, I just finished a class at the University of Chicago and I felt that they really do, I do understand, are cognizant of these issues in a much broader way than I, than I am. I feel sort of on a, a hair on fire a lot of the time. If you were to start off right now, if you're 20 years old, um, what would you do, each of you? What would you pick as your area of expertise? If you couldn't pick the one you picked, don't say it, just what I've done already. <laughs> you know, it's sort of obvious. I would have gone today either in the study of the brain or in the study of AI because the, those are the most, those look like the most fascinating avenues for future understanding of human nature, actually. And what of the brain and studying how it works, figuring out the computer it yeah. is? Yeah, I mean, clearly it is a computer. Mm -hmm. And clearly we have very little idea of what it is. I mean, you know, if science continues to develop as it seems to be developing, then 200 years or 100 years from now, you know, with the knowledge of science of today that looks awesome, we look childish. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's very limited understanding of the world a century ago. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's what... That's AI what I or the brain. Think. What about you, Yuval? I would go either to study the mind, not the brain. Um, assuming we are now in a race, who hacks the mind? I mean, in the end, it's all about the mind, not the brain. Nobody cares about the brain as such. Oh. We mm -hmm. care about the brain because we think this is the door to the mind. And I think we are in a race, who hacks the, the human mind first? And if the AI does it first, then game over. And I think that to protect ourselves, the better we understand our own minds, that's the really only potential um, safeguard. So I would go in that direction. Or it's not so very different from what I'm doing anyway, but um, in the direction of, um, I would speak broadly about poetry, but not writing poems as poems, but the artistic imagination, because we need a good story to deal with what's happening. But my view of history is that in the end, the most powerful force in history, at least until today, were fictional stories. This is what united millions of people together. You can't unite people with science. It's not interesting enough. It's not easy enough to understand. You need a good story. And what we are seeing now is a kind of crisis of the imagination that most of the stories, not all, but most of the stories, are, you know, even if science fiction, too many science fiction plots are focused on the wrong thing. You have so many movies about the robots rebelling, coming to kill us, very few movies about the robots don't try to kill us. They just manage the financial system in a way that we don't understand. Mm -hmm. Now, how to make an interesting sci-fi movie about a world in which the financial system is run by AI, nobody's being killed by, by the Terminator, but how mm -hmm. does it look? So, you know, something like Black Mirror, or at least some of the episodes in Black Be Mirror, I, 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 I will, having my life again, I would like to be today in a position that I'm, I can do something like that to do that, to make something like that. One of the things I often tell Silicon Valley engineers when I'm talking to them is I said, imagine your invention is an episode of Black Mirror, uh, which is always terrible and don't make it like, or, or figure out a way to make it that 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 uh, yeah. creates it a more benign version of what you're creating. No, what, what I usually tell them in, in the same vein is think about the politician you, you most dislike in mm -hmm. your country or in the world and now think what he or she will do with your invention and now think again about how to plan, how to design your invention. I have to end, end on one last question they have at the bottom here, because it's going to be a very difficult one. Um, but I'll give you a choice. Uh, the question is, what is the meaning of life? Which is too hard, <laughs> which is too hard. Everyone has a different meaning. I'm going to change that just a little bit and talk about, if you say we have to rewrite our stories, what does the best future look like in 100 years for each of you? What does this society look like? Daniel, I'll start with you. It's a society possibly in which we have hacked human nature and in which we control some of the aggressive impulses and, and in which uh, education and, and maybe more than education, maybe hacking human beings uh, has 
made people better able to live in peace and to live interesting lives and rich lives. That's a hope. It's a distant hope. You all, let's have you have the last word. Uh, I think that two key things is first that the, the power resulting for all these inventions is shared not equally between everybody, but at least not concentrated in the hands of a tiny elite, either a human elite or a non-human elite. And secondly, very close to what Daniel just said, that um, the power to hack human beings is used not to manipulate us, not to control us, but to help us understand ourselves better and uh, improve ourselves. You know, the old saying that know thyself. Mm -hmm. Now we have the technology to do it. If the technology is used for our benefit and not for the benefit of some big corporation or totalitarian government, then this can be really the, the, the best society that ever existed. That sounds like a great thing. It sounds like non-fungible tokens. Well, suddenly all, do you know about those? Don't eat. We're not even going to get into it. Um, I really appreciate it. You two are so amazing and smart. And I think this will be, uh, this conversation it was very uh, thought provoking for me at least. And I appreciate all your work. I'm looking forward to Daniel's uh, new book, Getting Out There, Noise. And Yuval, what are you working on? A children's book, which is supposed to come out. I, I'm, I'm working actually on two, a graphic novel for adults. Mm -hmm. which is already out, the first part, and a children's book, which is supposed to come out next year. All right. Well, I appreciate it. Thank you so much, both of you.